Ines is here from Tunisia. Vanessa from Brazil. Fatma is here. Oh, it's going too fast now. Oh, Jennifer's here. That's a good thing because it's her class. Ahmed <laughs> is here. David's here. Yusef is here from Morocco. From Spain, we have Yomi. Jack Askew is here from North Kakalaka. That's North Kakalaka Jacka. Suleiman's here. Suleiman, I can't remember where you're from. Where you're from. I want to say Pakistan, but I'm not sure. We got Dubai in the house. Libby is here. Shaki facilitator VIP is here from Yemen. More Brazil. We got Greece. Vietnam. Wow. Senegal, wonderful. Uh, Jennifer Lebedev, also known as, or better known as, do you, you probably know AKA? Do you know BKA? That's better known as Jennifer ESL, or English with Jennifer. She is an incredible person, teacher, content creator, and YouTube teacher pioneer. Forget about just ESL YouTube teacher pioneer. She is a YouTube teaching pioneer, full stop, period. And I wore this shirt today in honor of her. Can you see what that says? Who can tell me what that says? That's ES Celebrity. You want one of those, Paula? I'll bring them to Brazil. Uh, I'm going to send Jennifer one of these. I only have a few of them. She really needs one of those because she is an inspiration to me and so many other people. She is a true ES celebrity. This is the ES celebration. We're sparking it off with our festival ELT techniques. I'm going to bring Jennifer in. Is that okay? Can I bring Jennifer in? It is her class, right? <laughs> How many of you know Jennifer from her videos? Let's just see. How many of you have seen a, a YouTube video created by Jennifer ESL or English with Jennifer? How many of your students like to watch Jennifer's uh, videos? Do you have students that like to watch them? Yeah? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> presenting. <laughs> the world famous Jennifer Levinev. So glad to see you I, here, Jennifer. Can, can you hear us? Or me? Can you hear me, Jace? I can hear you perfectly. Let's ask everyone here. Yeah. If they... Everyone can you hear me. Hello, hello. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Oh, good. Dr. Nelly Deutsch in the house. Oh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> oh, Hosanna's here from Brazil. Woohoo! <laughs> okay. So, uh, what we're going to do is uh begin i'm going to bring in jennifer if you would just uh, greet everyone i'm going to bring in your uh powerpoint here yes the uh, powerpoint would be helpful <laughs> yes it's coming up and i want to so say I, I hope everybody will forgive the commercial airline pilot appearance but this guarantees a good quality <laughs> audio and video experience so i have the headset going on making me feel like a commercial airline pilot but <laughs> If you can hear me fine, then we're great to go. I'm thank you. So thank you. Jeez, that was a wonderful welcome. I'm all excited. Your enthusiasm Good. is contagious. So all I'm right. excited to be here. You know, this is my first MOOC. My first MOOC. Is it your first MOOC, anybody? Who's who's having a first MOOC experience today? <laughs> so you might be just as excited as I am, right? High energy, yes. Isn't it amazing? We're all in different places, and the energy on the internet is amazing. It I'm truly so excited. is. I'm so excited. <laughs> so it's so much fun. I've had so much fun already. I've, all the way till last night till bedtime, and then this morning, as soon as the kids went off to school, I'm back online. I'm reading ideas. I apologize if I didn't get to everybody. I went all the way till like 9.30, which is like a half hour ago, reading the ideas. They're coming. They're coming. Thank you, everyone, for participating in the pre-class task. Um, I, I gained ideas from you. And that's one thing I'll say now. I hope I remember to say it again. If I don't, I'll say it now. Thank you. Because um, 
I think it's not so much what even what you're going to take away from me. I hope you take something away from me. But I think because of this topic, the nature of it, it's content creation, we'll be exchanging ideas. And if you just take the time to look at the pre-class task, you are going to learn from one another. There are things that I forgot about. I'm like, oh, wow, cartoons. Yeah, role play, present. I forgot about these ideas. You guys are giving me ideas, and I hope you read the suggestions that um, people have for what you can do with a word list. It's like 101 ideas of what you can do with a word list. You guys are supplying the amazing ideas. <laughs> I'm just sort of guiding you. Um, I, so it's, it's I, been it's wonderful. It's just exhilarating to, I mean, I've heard this from e e anyone and everyone that's been in your position, Jennifer, but to hear you say it, as someone that, you know, so many people have benefited from, uh, you know, in a sort of a one way direction through uh, your content and videos, it just must just be, you know, for them to hear that, you know, you're getting ideas. Yeah, and I always do. I mean, even right, for the videos themselves, Jason, I, all of you guys, when you comment to me, I read those comments. I, I mean, I understand what, what um, you guys are saying. You give me feedback, you give me suggestions, I take them, but I'm just yeah. so excited about this experience. Uh, Jason, <laughs> well, I, don't I, leave me here. Stay with me as we go through this. <laughs> you're, 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 you're absolutely and, and other platforms provide an opportunity for dialogue, but it's nothing compared to what we're doing here uh, as far as just how we can feel as presenters getting all of those ideas. Uh, and, you know, we, we say it's kind of the cliche now. We're learning as much or more than you are. But it, the point is, you know, we're, we're all sharing in this real-time situation around content that just it has no other comparison, I think. At yeah, this I'm, so no, I'm truly I'm humbled, I'm thankful, and inspired. <laughs> so let's begin. <laughs> so today, guys, we are going to be focusing on, I love it, content creation, materials design. Woo, I love it. Principles of content creation pronunciation lessons. Now, some of the principles, all the principles I'm going to share with you simple, are straightforward, rather obvious, but sometimes I feel when we have this opportunity to create materials, we get caught up in this creative process and you sometimes can forget some of the basic principles. So that's why we're going to review them, talk about them, and through our um, pre- and post-class tasks, we'll share ideas when we realize these principles, how we put them to use in the content that we generate. Okay, but first um, we need to figure out, well, Jace, I need your help here because I don't see a button to get through my slides. <laughs> I did I did give you, Jace, you the controls for that, but um, let me check that again. I can always do it myself if there's an issue, but I can and, and uh, you, know? you may even want to do that because that way you can focus okay, on. Okay, let's stuff. do that. I'll do my little magical click there. And, and okay. you wanted to ask them a question, is that right? I that do. Can you go to the next slide, Jace? Click. Sure. And I want to find out what are we creating content for? Where do you guys teach? All right, so what setting? Um, let's do a quick poll and find out what are you creating content for? Do you teach in a traditional classroom? Do you teach face-to-face, -face, privately, one-on-one, -on -one? or do you teach um, in online on, on the online platform, some kind of online platform? And you may teach in more than one setting. If that's the case, I'd like to know that as well. I'm checking it now. Or the poll is coming. We've got awesome. 18 people have voted. 18, only 18. 22. Oh, look at this. <laughs> We're getting a lot of people voting. Thank you so much for voting. You can put it in the chat also, but check the poll out, please, because that's where we're going to really be able to see and compare. F2F, a lot of F2F people face-to-face. -face. Oh, yeah. We're up to, it looks like, 40 traditional classroom teachers. Okay. Of course, probably people do can do more than one. Yes, yes, and that's my uh, case. Yeah. So I imagine there, there could be a good mix, um, but my guess, not seeing the results, but you're seeing it on your end, Jace, my guess is that the majority are probably in the face-to-face -face traditional classroom. Absolutely, I agree. And uh, by the way, that, that is sort of a myth sometimes about what we're doing here when, when people hear about this move yeah. is, oh, we're teaching how to teach online. No, we're not. What we're doing is using this technology to share ideas for everywhere and anyone and how we teach. And that's still, of course, in the traditional classroom more than anywhere else. Um, has everybody voted? Can I publish these results?
I think so. You think so? <laughs> You're thinking about ah option one. So option one was our traditional face to face. The middle one was one to one. I like to see people doing that one to one. You know, it is also a wonder. It's a, it's a different but beautiful experience as well. One to one, private. Um, and then we have online. It's so nice to see those numbers climbing year by year, huh, Jace? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So that was my, my guess, that we'd have a mix but majority teaching in a classroom setting. So I think what's going on is that some of you are in a traditional classroom. And perhaps you have pronunciation materials assigned to your course, a textbook. And, but still, even we're creating and finding some additional materials. And then some of you are in a situation where you do not have any pronunciation materials assigned to your course. So for pronunciation practice, it's up to you to create things for your students. As for me, I do create instructional videos on pronunciation and ethics. I've been doing that since 2007. But over the past few years, I've also been teaching privately through Skype one-on-one. -on -one. And I've worked with students who want to work on their pronunciation. For these kinds of students, I've created a lot of customized materials. Some of my ideas I share on my blog on WordPress. And so what you'll find on WordPress often are ideas that I've done one-on-one, -on -one, but when I publish them, I modify it for a classroom setting, knowing that that's the setting that the majority of people teach in. I will talk a video making today, but primarily our focus is going to be on live instruction, but it can be online, okay? So let's, without further ado, jump into our first principle. Click, Jace. <laughs> let's see if the magic works. Woohoo, first principle. Allow for meaningful practice. Okay, I think we're all going to agree this is a principle to hold, right? We need meaningful practice. If we're teaching, Teaching learners to use a language for communication, there needs to be meaningful practice in our classroom. But this raises the question of meaningful versus rote. Right? Should the exercises that we do, should the exercises that we create always have a meaningful context? Think about it. So click. <laughs> the more direct question I want to ask is, is there a place for rote learning? And by that, I mean, is there a place where, is there a time and a place for the kind of learning where language is not contextualized, where elements are repeated and practiced over and over, they become automatic? So meaningful context is crucial in learning process. Yes, routine, drilling is what I mean. Wrote. Yes, sometime. Aha, good answer. Okay. Yes, I agree. Yes, there is a place for this kind of rote learning. When used thoughtfully and carefully by the teacher, it can help us. Look at the dancers in this class, in, in, in the photo. They're standing at the bar, right? And what are they doing? They're doing isolated movements. They're practicing, repeating, and they're working to the point where these movements become so familiar that they can put them into a real performance, real use. Click. <laughs> so I feel if we use rote practice, rote learning in a thoughtful way, it helps build us, build us a bridge to meaningful use. We go from rote practice to meaningful practice to meaningful use. Because ultimately, what are we doing? We're preparing learners for real communication. Right? So often, I hope I'll mention, that especially in a pronunciation class, there are things that students do, and they're doing it pretty well, right? But then they move towards this other situation, this other context, and it's hard for them to transfer those skills um, for real performance, for real use. So this is about building a bridge to meaningful use, right? Click. Let's take a look at what rote learning might look like and how we build this bridge towards meaningful use. Um, again, I encourage you to look on that page on WizIQ and check out all the wonderful ideas uh, in the pre-class task. I asked you to choose 10 words for high beginners, ING words. There are some really creative approaches to choosing words. Um, I, I love some of them. Some of you want to focus on word formation, so you carefully chose words that would show different spelling rules. Um, I loved her idea idea of using antonyms, so like uh, morning, evening, something, nothing. That was very creative. These are my 10 words that I came up with. Can anyone looking at them 
First of all, I hope you agree they're appropriate for high beginners. But secondly, why did I put them in three columns? Does anyone know? Nope. <laughs> this is pronunciation class. And I'm thinking about the position of the sounds around them. Not so much syllables. They're all two syllables, aren't they? Learning, doing. Got it. Learning, explaining, teaching, helping. Before the ing, what sounds have? Learning, explaining, teaching, helping, hitting, having. Consonant, okay? Consonant before the ing, and then doing, showing. What do we have there? Vowel to vowel, but I'm linking with a w, w sound. Doing, showing. Third column, trying, playing. I'm linking with the y, y sound. So I am at the word level, but I'm thinking about how ing is positioned within the word, what's before it, what's leading into that, okay? What could you do with a word list? You had some wonderful ideas on the pre-class task. Um, everybody seemed to give emphasis to the need for repetition, and I agree right, at the bar, doing that movement over and over and over again to make their body familiar with the movements. When we're in pronunciation, it's the articulators that need to become comfortable with these movements. They're in a new language, the L2, and they need to move their articulators in new sounds and become comfortable moving in that way. Repetition, movement, all building up for real use, real performance. How could you read these? You guys suggested um, teacher gives the model, listen, repeat, choral repetition. A few of you really emphasize the need for peer feedback. I love that idea so that you can do some paired readings, partner up, listen to each other, give some feedback. All very good ideas. Okay, but now that these words are isolated and they've practiced the sound, just making the sound, text, what would I do? Where's my magic click? <laughs> Building upward in content. One possibility is to show a photo. And some of you had the similar ideas of using some sort of visual prompt. A photo then starts to give a context. I move to the phrase level. And the phrases relate to the photo. So we're starting to build meaning, starting to build context. But do you think this is a, a task that really challenges comprehension? Is it really a lot to take in? Yes, no? Hopefully no. Right. So I feel at this point we're still focusing on articulation, so I don't want to tax students with comprehension. But I'm building this context. We're at the phrase level. Playing baseball, hitting the ball, trying to hit, teaching his son. At this point you're also getting into the rhythm because we're moving upward in language. Where can we go from here? If I went from word level to phrase level, what should we go? Where should we go next? Any ideas? What would you do? Sentences. I agree. Okay, check out this idea. Building content. Something I did in activity is then I had three photos total and then I had these groups of sentences and students would have to select five to seven sentences, show one photo at a time, and ask them to select five to seven sentences. And there are different possibilities. Some sentences will relate, some won't. But choose five to seven that could. Click. So that could be done solo, in pairs, as a class. I would probably recommend doing pairs or a class. Do you know why? Because as they're talking and selecting, they're already using the target sound at the sentence level. Now the fun can be is asking them to sequence those five to seven sentences, right? And you're giving a little bit of control. We'll talk more about this as we go on. You're giving up some of your control and giving control to them, and it's a gradual transition. So let's look at one possible final product. Click. <laughs> So there's different variations. This could be one buddy. You finally are text. People were suggesting, yes, do a short story, do a dialogue. I agree. But my strategy usually is to build up towards that because I don't want to tax comprehension if we're still training with the sound, ing, ing, teaching, doing, trying. We move to the phrase level, sentence level. We're
fact, they have. So now you could read it. How would you read it? How would you read this text with a student? Yes, you built the context together. Now you have it. How could you practice it? What would you do? I'm looking for ideas. Would you do it repetition? Mm. Pair work? Mm -hmm. All of those ideas, not just one. I'd read it you know, as a class, read it in pairs. At this stage of the game, you could also get into thought groups using those forward slashes. What is happening? A father is teaching his son to play baseball. They are in a park. They are having fun together. Is the boy doing well? Yes. This is a special moment for them, right? Over and over again. And something that came up, I was so glad that I got to see Jace's class um, on shrinking and linking because, you know what, ING, what did I choose ING? And I started thinking about how you teach ING, the sound, with beginners. And I was thinking about reduction, the shrinking and linking. And something Jace said makes a lot of sense and ties into this kind of exercise. Would you teach reduction directly to these students? Would you say, oh, by the way, now let's try it this way. What's happening? <laughs> a father is teaching a son. No, but does that mean you don't expose them to that kind of speech just because they're beginners? Reduction is natural. Yes, yes. So Jesus idea can come into play here. You're practicing it different ways multiple times over and over again. As they're becoming more familiar with the content and doing multiple readings, the reading becomes more natural. If you start emphasizing then the stress and the rhythm, the reduction will follow naturally. So you don't have to teach it directly necessarily. I think especially for the beginners, that kind of explanation could be too much. This is something that could happen indirectly. Um, so I, I think you can see if you follow along to all these different classes, I hope you will, like I do, see the common threads, how you can apply different ideas. Um, it's all going towards the end goal. It's a common goal, isn't it? But look what we can do here. I talked about giving up some control, giving more control to them, because you're building that bridge to self-expression. You're building that bridge used for right now. situations, right? Click, Jace. Look what happens next. You can allow them to do more expression. Up till now, they've been just playing and manipulating your stuff. Now you can invite them to insert a couple of lines. Say, could you guys add two lines to the text? But at least one ING word has to be used. So they brainstorm maybe with a partner, come up with a new text. It's modified. They're starting to put their own hands on this, their own, like, say, footprint on it. Now he is a good father. He's trying hard. Again, multiple readings, repetition. We're starting to get into our second principle, Jace. <laughs> oh, wait. Yes. Let's see if we go to the next slide. Yep. Allow for personalized content. All right. Now we're going to talk about teacher-created versus student-created content. So in that baseball photo activity, they're mostly working with my content, but I did allow them to have a chance to control it and manipulate it, play around with it. Um, but now we want to talk about how we do work with student-created content. Um, some of you guys on the pre-class task were talking about sentence generations, um, story making, all good ideas. Let's go to the next slide and ask an important question first. Okay, we want student-created content. We want to give them control. The question is, when? When do you give them control of the content? Any ideas? Project-based approach. When they're ready. <laughs> yes, when they're ready. That's the best answer. After you've modeled. Yes. After they've received enough input, right? A blank cam canvas can be very overwhelming. When they have enough ideas, OK. Scaffolding. I love the idea of scaffolding. All very good thoughts, OK. Let's go to the next slide, and I'll give you my first answer to that question. When do you give them control? This is pronunciation. When meaning doesn't interfere with articulation, right? Have you had it when there's a text? You want to read it with a student. If you look at the reading the first time and ask them to read it, chances are either one, They'll read it nice and smoothly, but they're not going to understand everything they read. Or they're going to work hard on comprehending it, and the reading's going to be choppy, 
Why? Because meaning and articulation, they're interfering. So if you're going to ask for student-generated content in a pronunciation lesson, it has to be at a point when meaning doesn't interfere with articulation. So check out this exercise, word lists. Um, let's say you want to build a word list, and we're going to work on NG and K combinations, long, strongest, uncle. And somebody on the pre-class task um, had pointed out that the G and K is a particular name that can trouble Turkish students, so um, th this might work well. Anyways, let's say you want to build a word list. You could ask for their suggestions, right? And I love that l some of you were thinking about that, not just giving a word list, but helping, allowing students to help you build it in some way. Um, I saw some creative ideas like miming to elicit the words that you want, um, drawing pictures, photos. Um, some of you had the cyclical idea, like you present the story first, present the dialogue or song first, pull the ING or in this case NG and K words out and then plug them into a chart. So there's different ways. You can start out with that large context, pull your words out, start building up and then end back Back with a meaningful context again. That was a very nice approach um, to, to the word list task. Okay, what would I do? Let's go to the next slide. Let's say you prompt students to use the words that you know are coming up in your subsequent activities. Click! <laughs> so this is one possibility. Um, you come up with these sets of words. You either prompt them or start listing them yourselves. And then you practice them in the ways we did our ING. Choral repetition, paired reading, solo. Um, and I like the idea of solo too. Sometimes people are, get it, it, sort of self-conscious speaking out loud, especially with pronunciation. You know, But if everybody in the classroom is doing it, then they're, they're left self-conscious. Um, so there's multiple ways you can practice. Um, just reading the words, getting their articulators familiar with those movements. But we need to start building upward in context, right? Where do we go? I decided to build text. Some of you also love the idea of um, making stories. I love writing stories. So I created three short stories for upper level students. But the fun each posed a problem so that not only would we be able to discuss these texts, uh, we would read them and then discuss them. So you could at least get a couple different uses out of them. Let's take a look on the next slide at one of those texts that I created. Okay. So they're going to read the text and then they can discuss it once the content is familiar. Okay, let's have some fun and read along. This is my short story. An old king wanted to give each of his young sons a chance to win the crown. He thought at length and then decided to give the crown to the strongest fighter of the three. The two older sons had much physical strength and were eager to prove themselves. The youngest was strong in other ways. He could think on his feet. His skilled fingers could paint well. And people drank in every note he sang. What do you think? Did the king approach the situation from the wrong angle? Should physical strength alone have ability to lead? Right? Obviously, if, again, what did I say about reading the first time? What do you think's best, having the students read this or you read? What would you do? First reading. Listen, 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 practice, practice, practice. Yeah, see, I would read it, right? A lot of you share that idea of teacher modeling. Give them the model first, right? Then practice it. Make sure it's all familiar. Multiple readings. Once the content has been read and practiced, understood, you can move in towards discussion. Right? That was the whole goal, to practice the NG and K in a meaningful context. You want the self-expression, but you want that self-expression to happen when you've prepared them, when they feel ready for that larger context. Some people are raring to go, and they're ready to jump into that right away. But many learners, I feel, need you to build that bridge, and we can do that through content. Right? OK, let's go to the next slide. Oops, magical clue there. I said, when do we give them control? I said, when meaning doesn't interfere with articulation, when confidence has grown. Let's say you've done the reading, you've discussed the story about the king. Now is a point when you can let them
words from our, that word chart in task A. Pairs may exchange papers and discuss the situations described by their classmates. So this is an actual activity I post on WordPress. There's a link that's not clickable right now. It will be on our course page later. But think about this activity. How much use are you going to get out of those student-created texts? How many things? Once they write their text, what can they do with it? A lot, <laughs> yeah. It loosens up adult learners, surely, to be loosened up. If they sat down in your classroom, you say, write a story. It's, it's a little too much too soon, right? Lots. So they're going to read it. They're exchanging papers. They can read and discuss each other's papers. So they're still working with those same exact target words, the same target sound, over and over again. But we've sort of disguised it and built some really interesting content around it. They're practicing those sounds over and over again in a meaningful context, in new contexts now, because they're exchanging papers um, and, and discussing new stories. Um, relax, repeat, remember, yes. And you're going to see how that plays into building content, especially for, for this kind of pronunciation lesson. Okay? All right, let's go to our next slide and talk about our third principle. Allow for multiple encounters, exploring formats, right? And you're seeing that already in the kinds of um, exercises and activities I'm showing to you. So if you are going to take the time to create content, you want to get as much as you can out of it, right? And same thing with students. It's a lot to generate content, especially in, in the second language. So you want to get the maximum potential, get the maximum benefit out of what you create, right? So let's look at the next slide. Go back to this text. And you tell me multiple readings formats. How many ways can you read this? How can you work with this text? I want to see lots of ideas. How would you read this text? How many ways? Teacher can read it. What else? Partners. Solo. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then, of course, you can read it with different emphasis. Now read it and place in the thought groups, the word stress. Let's read it again. Mm -hmm. Chunking, point by point, line by line, right? You can read it. Let's go to the next slide. Teacher, student, parents, friends, great. Bring in other people. Take it home. You know, we forget the, the, the opportunities that homework um, brings. You know, go home. If, if they are parents, they can read to um, children. If they have brothers, sisters, read to siblings. I mean, you know, it's, it's nice to make um, homework social in that way. Multiple readings. You, as a class, read it with a partner. Discuss it with a partner. After you discuss with a partner, now you're ready to share with the class. Record text, right? Recordings can be very helpful in pronunciation, right? Teacher can record and make it accessible to the students so they can listen to your recording uh, a number of times. The students can record the text. And what benefit could students get if they record it more than once? Any ideas? I have my students recording. Check. Oh, good. Um, that's the other thing I want to ask you. What are you using? If those of you who know the benefits of recording, what do you use to have them record? You could use, um, what do we have, like sound recorder, voice memo on, on an app that you use. We can share ideas on our class page later. Voice thread. Mm-hmm. They get self-confident trying to speak. And, and if they're also recording, they get to choose which recording they're going to submit or share. They can do it multiple times until they're pretty happy and they'll submit that first one. But I would encourage them, let's say, not just the next day or even the next week, but give them the chance to practice and record a bit later, even at the end of the month, beginning and end. And then you and the student can compare those two recordings and see the progress that's been made multiple encounters, you're building up that um, comfort level, the familiarity, repetition, repetition, and they're becoming more natural, more smooth, and they should be happier with the final product. Yes, it also improves their speaking. Yes, and isn't it wonderful that if, if you get over that initial um, that issue of self-consciousness and self-awareness, like, I don't like to listen to my voice recorded. Well, but when you listen, you hear yourself in, in a way that you don't when you're actually speaking. Right? Okay, so that's with a text. You can get multiple readings out of a text. Don't just read it once. Read it different ways in different formats. Let's go to the next slide and talk about lists, word lists. 
Lesson one, build the list as a class. Lesson two, take that same list, take all the words out, scramble them, let them build the list again. Do they remember how those sounds are distinct? All right, test them out. Lesson one, lesson two, you can do the listen repeat. Both lesson one, lesson two, you can use the words to compose a text or sentences, perhaps the first time generating together and then the second time allowing them to generate independently, completely. But again, how much can you get out of a word list? Hopefully a, a lot, a lot of practice. Um, the choral repetition at the word level and then moving towards um, bigger texts. All right. Let's go to our next slide. Quick. <laughs> These are some other links I'm going to share with you um, on our class page. Um, two other activities. Press. They'll be clickable links when we place them on our class page together. My ideas are there for two reasons. One, you might like them as is and you're free to use them as they are. Um, but maybe they'll just serve as a model and they'll prompt you to create something similar. And I also hope they'll show you how I've tried to apply these principles and most of what I do. We want to allow for meaningful practice, allow for personalized content, and allow for multiple encounters. Right? We could stop there, but there's one more very important principle that I think we need to discuss, and I think you enjoy discussing it. So I think we're good on time, right, Jace? So let's go on to our last principle. Click. <laughs> And it's about building confidence, building confidence, right? Especially in the case of pronunciation, do you find there are self-esteem issues? Yes, yes, says Sylvia, right? What, what are they afraid of? Adults are more reluctant? Mm -hmm. Definitely, right? I think, um, you know, it doesn't matter how well we design our materials, how engaging the content is. If, if there's a lack of confidence, it's really hard to move forward, isn't it? Our, our, the content's not going to be effective if we have um, some barriers that haven't been broken down. Um, so how do we do that? How do we begin to break down barriers? Uh, adults are reluctant seeing their identity is being threatened. Yes, they're afraid of making mistakes. Yeah, cultures, genders come into play. It's just a feeling of being scared. Yeah. You can feel the air come out. Oh, no, 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 you're talking about, okay, they're reluctant. Even with small children, yes, yes, okay. So let's go to our next slide. Click. Okay. And talk about how we can enable the student. I think partly this can be done by allowing the them some control to personalize the content, to give them that sense of ownership. Right? That it's not just your lesson, it's our lesson. And when they start to feel like this is for them and it's theirs as well, um, it becomes easier to move forward. But as I said, some people are you know, they're excited to have that invitation to speak out and generate ideas. Other people might be overwhelmed by that kind of invitation too soon. So you build the bridge. And I find, you know, sentence starters, prompts, a template like this enables the student. The directions here are to complete the text, then read it aloud and focus on linking a final vowel sound to an initial vowel sound. So the text is just very um, simple. It shouldn't be too difficult for lower level students to complete. And I've already built in instances of linking vowel to vowel. Do you see the first one? I enjoy. I enjoy. Do you see any other instances of vowel to vowel linking? Well, who can say enjoy? You see the next one? Look in the second sentence. Me outdoors. Me outdoors. Third sentence. Go out. Go out. Mm -hmm. There's one more in the next question. Do others. Do others. Uh -huh. Next one. I often. I often. See others. See others. So there already are instances of linking. And um, once the students create their text, you can read them. And you'll highlight the linking that already is there, but probably some students will complete it in such a way that they'll give you new instances, new examples of linking, and now you can use those student-generated examples to practice more. They're going to take their text.
each time they're so enabling the student, we can build content in such a way that enables them. Let's, lose, let's go to the next slide and talk about something I do in video, okay? Leading by example, our example and other students' example. Something I decided to do for beginners um, in, on YouTube was I chose a friend and learner. She wanted to learn. And I said, well, gosh, I'm not sure if I have the time, but maybe if you're willing to go on camera with me, I'll teach you and we'll build lessons for beginners. And she agreed and so amazingly brave and courageous to do this with me. Um, Natasha came on camera and this is a scene from our first lesson. And she just gave this wonderful example that I didn't even ask her to do. I'm writing on the board and she's repeating. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Then the next line. How are you? How are you? Because I was telling her the difference. If I'm the first person asking the question, you'd say, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? With stress on you. So she was practicing saying it two different ways. How are you? How are you? How are you? How are you? Over and over again while I was writing, she was repeating. And I loved that example. This was about not the, de the content that I designed, but how we were delivering the content in this video by example, and what we were showing just by the very format that this is a process, guys. It doesn't come easily. Lots of repetition, and it it's to take practice and training. And I love the message that she was sending. And you know what's the message I'm sending too as a teacher, that me and I, as a teacher and a student, we make mistakes, and we don't always get it. I don't always give that perfect explanation right off the bat and she doesn't always give that perfect production on her first try through you know multiple tries repetition um, it's okay to make mistakes uh, and that's how we learn as teachers and, and as students and I thought that was really wonderful to have her um, I hope I can continue making some more lessons with Natasha but I know um, people have commented that she has inspired others. They, she has given them confidence, saying, oh, you know, now that I've watched Natasha, I think I can try too. You know, I've heard about um, people's moms watching, <laughs> and I, it really excites me to know that the very nature of the content was inspiring people. It gave them confidence to try, and I love that, okay? All right, let's go to another slide and show you another approach I've done. You know, let's talk about humanizing the content. It's, I think it could be a little bit easier in a classroom setting to make that, um, not the classroom, but the live instruction allows us more quickly, perhaps more easily, to make that emotional connection. When you're making a video, how do you do that right away? How do you humanize the content and, and connect on an emotional level with this unseen audience? One way I've done that is um, I've taken real objects, not just things I've picked up randomly, like, you know, my car keys or my coffee mug. I've thought about personal objects and brought them into my lessons. This was a lesson, um, ideation and rhythm, and I did nursery rhymes. So I found a family blanket, and there were nur nursery rhymes stitched onto it. So I talked about the blanket, the rhymes. And I think just that very nature made it less, like, textbooky and, and, and more like a, just a person you know, talking about <laughs> nursery rhymes and asking you to repeat along. And I felt that that sort of relaxed people and, and just um, brought it down to a comfortable level. And they were ready to try saying the nursery rhymes with me. <laughs> so, another way, just to break down some... Let's go to the next slide. So I think um, in our content and also like especially in videos, you can get personal, um, but you can also stay professional. Isn't that that's a fine line to walk sometimes as teachers, but I think it's one we have to walk. So this is a scene or a, a screenshot from another video I had on pronunciation and content words stressed words, and I was talking about the various hairstyles I've had over the years, and I think I did show some embarrassing pictures too <laughs> from my junior high 80s curly hair days. Um, so I had this one with the content, I've had long straight hair for most of my life. A simple hairstyle makes life easier. I admit that I've had a few bad haircuts in the past. <laughs> Okay, so again, they're seeing it, they're laughing, and laughter is a great thing, right? If you get people to laugh, even at your own expense, they're, they're more relaxed. Um, so, you know, and opportunities for humor are also um, important to take advantage of, and that's what I did in this topic. <laughs> Let's go to our next slide. 
Okay, let's return to the analogy um, of, of dancing. You know, I said it, in pronunciation, um, it's very similar to dancing in that there's a lot of repetition. There can be isolated practice at first, but then and it's all transitioning towards a real performance. I want to ask, is there a better analogy? Have you ever thought about that analogy of what is language learning like? Is it like dancing? It could be like something else. Did anyone ever think about that question? It's like music, yeah, like learning the piano, something like that. <laughs> Racing, <laughs> right? Well, let me give you an idea, another analogy that's been working for me. Let's go to the next slide, Jace. Lately, believe it or not, I don't know if you know, <laughs> I have been a student of the martial arts. I, uh, taking Taekwondo classes um, since May of this year. And it's something I never thought I would get into, but I absolutely love it. And I'm seeing a lot of parallels. Um, and if I can go on one little tangent, I will here. Professional development, I think one of the most powerful forms of development for me is putting myself back in the role of a learner and taking myself out of my comfort zone. And I think if you have opportunities to do that, you should take advantage of them. I did a few years ago with roller skating. <laughs> and so I'm roller skating better now uh, in, in my later years than I did as a kid. And this year, I've taken up martial arts. I never thought I'd do such a thing. But I, I'm doing it, and I'm enjoying the experience very much and, and remembering what it's like to be a learner. And I'm seeing parallels between pronunciation and martial arts. There's form. There's technique. There's a lot of, believe it or not, another person um, who's been inspiring me lately is Bruce Lee. Are there any Bruce Lee fans out there? <laughs> Everyone know who Bruce Lee is? Yes, big fan. Yeah, yes, yes. Bruce Lee was cool. <laughs> well, if you're curious, I'll share some links. Um, Bruce Lee has some interviews, and some of the excerpts are posted on YouTube. And he speaks about um, the importance of self-expression. And even though he's speaking about martial arts, he's talking about honesty and self-expression and the need not to imitate but to be yourself. And I think that's really interesting. You know, in martial arts, you go to class, and in the pronunciation room, you have a model. Your teacher, your instructor is doing something, and then you want to produce, reproduce what they did exactly, right? And it's all about approximation at first. You're trying to do what they do as close as you can. But is that really the end goal? You know, not really. The end goal is not to be exactly like your teacher or someone in the movies. The end goal is to be you. You're taking these skills and ultimately you'll be your, you will own these skills to express yourself. And in martial arts, they have these belt systems. And by the way, I'm only a yellow belt, but I went from white to orange, now I'm yellow. I have a long way to go. And that also helps me remember that this is a process. Learning is a process. And I can't be a black belt tomorrow. I can't even be a black belt next year. It's going to take me time to get there. And I think it's almost sad that we don't have the visual cues like belts uh, in the pronunciation classroom because for some students, if they don't ration there, um, but they need to remember it's a process, repetition, practice, multiple encounters, you'll get there. But ultimately, the goal to wear my instructor's black belt, I'm going to earn my own. So same thing, we're giving skills to our students, not so they can be like us and speak like us, but to use them in, in their own self-expression. Let's go to the next slide and, and talk again about self-esteem. I've had self-esteem esteem issues in my Taekwondo class. Um, there are things I'm pretty good at and things I'm picking up, and there are things I really struggle with. I love the forms probably because I have some background in dance. And I love the weapons, believe it or not. <laughs> it's really cool. I'm working with my hands. But the sparring, um, I'm getting scared about. And I think um, the instructors have been wonderful supporting me, enabling me. And I think we need to help, as teachers, our students break some figurative boards. And one thing that's true, I think, of all martial arts schools is a positive attitude. In my school, <laughs> sometimes they say, drop, do five push-ups. We are not allowed to say the word can't.
right? We have to say, I'm trying, I will be able to do it, but we can't say, no, I can't do it. This is too hard. No, it's difficult, but I'm trying. Positive attitude. So we can do this through our content. Let's go to the next slide, and I'll share an idea with you. I have a beginner student, and I created a, some text for her to serve a few purposes. I wanted to review the irregular um, comparative and superlative forms for good, better, best. And I also wanted to build up her, her, her speaking and her oral fluency. So I asked her to read this with me. I read it, then she read it, then we read it. And feel the nature of this content as positive. When you study, you learn. Maybe you want to study. This is good. Maybe you plan to study. This is better. Maybe you are studying now and trying to learn. This is best. Remember, good, better, best. Wanting is good. Planning is better. Doing is best. Right? Go to the next slide. I'll show you one more piece from that activity. Still working with superlatives. Next slide, Jace. Click. <laughs> Oh, my clicking isn't working. <laughs> Where did my Jace go? My magic is gone. Jace, did I lose you? <laughs> there he's back. Yay. Far, farther, farthest. And by the way, I know even as a native speaker, I, I get those mixed up. Don't you mix up farther and further? But far, farther, farthest <laughs> for distance. When you walk, you go far. Don't stop. Go farther. Go the farthest you can. And again, I'll share the link with you if you're curious to see that full activity. But it's the idea of using the content itself to motivate students, to break down some barriers and tell them, you know, just try. And then you repeat it. You read this multiple times. Each time they read it, they're getting smoother. And hopefully um, the, the meaning will sink in and they'll realize, yeah, I am going. I'm getting farther, <laughs> farther than yesterday, All right? Okay, let's go to our next slide. And I want to highlight, um, TESOL Press has published this year uh, language teaching insights from other fields. Christopher Stillwell is the editor. If you like the idea of analogies um, and you like the idea of drawing expertise from other fields and applying it to your teaching, you'll really enjoy this book. Chapter 3 has really in-depth parallels drawn between martial arts um, and teaching. Um, and I, I forgive forgive me, Anne, if I'm saying the name wrong, Paonessa, um, draws some wonderful parallels and talks about disguising repetition. So she draws from her martial arts experience and talks about how that works in the classroom. So it's a, a title that I think um, you get something out of, I, so I recommend doing that. Let's go to our next slide as we wrap up and remember our principles. As we design our content, as you move into the post-class task, I want you to remember, allow for meaningful practice, allow for personalized content, allow for multiple encounters, and build learner confidence. I'm going to give you a choice of tasks, um, and it will be posted soon. Jace is going to help me get that up there. Um, you choose. If you want to do both, fine. Do one. That's fine. Do what you can do. But one of the tasks um, needs to be done if um, you're working towards that certificate, right? And this is one of your classes. Uh, but in any case, whether you are working towards the certificate or not, I'm so thankful that you joined me. I am so eager to go back even on the pre-class task page and, and see those ideas that you were sharing. Um, we have probably just a bit of time if Jace joins me and maybe we can handle some questions and carry on a discussion with the time we have left. Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you think, everybody? Do you think, do you think uh, Jen Jennifer is ready for uh, online teaching? <laughs> <laughs> it's a stupid question because she's been teaching online for years, but we're really happy to have her in this forum, in this format. Uh, because she's obviously um, incredible at it, right? So Thank to you. combine these ideas that she has, the experience she has, with the way she can communicate with us uh, in online, it's really it's rare and it's fa fabulous. And uh, we're so lucky to have you here, Jennifer. Oh, thank you, can you so see, much, Jay. You can see from the chat box that you uh, feeling the it love. Was, <laughs> you're feeling the love. No, thank uh, you. It, it may it may be a little tough to uh, field questions if things are going yeah. too quickly, but yeah. but but we can give it a shot. We can give it a shot. Uh, last night with Drew, uh, Drew's class, 
it was also pretty packed and we, we were able to do it. Um, we just have a few minutes. Does anyone have a question? And if I catch it, I'll just ask it right away. Of course, Jennifer, as you see, is really active also in WizIQ chatting with us. Uh, <laughs> Wait all the time, yeah. <laughs> I know you feel. JC, I think Jason is all the time. <laughs> wants to know how many fish you have. Uh, it's, I guess it's kind of hard to see behind you. <laughs> Three fish, Jack. Okay. Babu's got a question. How can I rebuild my st building, but rebuilding? If it's broken, especially if there's another teacher or a curriculum you know, that broke them, <laughs> what do you do? This is like why I draw those parallels, and that's why I said it's so important to put yourself back in the role of a learner, and I, I feel that with Taekwondo. I mean, there's one day I was, in, I was near tears, and I thought, you know what, it recalled me back to the time when um, I, I, I was... I was teaching in a classroom, and I was a program administrator, and I've, I, I've had students come to me in tears, too, talking about their frustrations or things that have happened, and, you know, sometimes it, it's, it's hard as, as the adult coming in and being this, ex, having this experience, and you feel vulnerable at times, and there's things that you're really good at. You're this working professional. You've achieved something in life, but then you come into this situation oh my gosh, this is really hard, and I'm not, I don't feel good at this, and then I don't feel good about myself, and you're sick, and you know what, then the environment comes from the teacher, comes from the peers, and then also I feel you need to focus on what you are good at and transfer some of that confidence back back to the one that's challenging you. Like in my case, I in Taekwondo, I feel like I'm picking up the forms, the weapons are so cool, but sparring, I'm like a fish out of the water, and but it, it's coming. Little by little, my instructors are working with me, and sometimes they break it down. And it is like breaking boards. We need to, they don't ask me to break the thickest, heaviest boards. They give me the easy one first. And I know it's easy, but you know, you give that solid whack, and I feel good. I broke a board. Cool. And now I'm ready to build, break the next one. So sometimes it is about, you know, putting them back on more familiar territory um, through exercises or content, um, giving some, them some control of the topic. And that's why so many of my exercises I can't share because I've really customized them for my learners. You know, I, I have I build content on what they do, what they want to talk about, their business, you know, their their practices, whether you know, uh, journalism or law. I want them first to talk about what's comfortable and meaningful to them, and then we start branching out. But if you need to come back to their comfort zone, come back to the comfort zone, and then start drawing them out. Absolutely. I just want to underscore something that Jennifer said. If you're a teacher of anyone besides young learners, so I mean middle school on up, often materials that are out there and in your curriculum, unfortunately, very often, if it's easy stuff, it's, it can often be baby stuff or things that are not, uh, they don't connect to. So, you know, it, it's not about giving things that are harder because they are older or smarter or more cognitively advanced. We've got to think of things that make them feel it's very easy, I can do it, but that are meeting their needs and interests. Uh, I think that is a very important area. And I think, you know, the fun and the laughter, you have to know when to use it, when it's going to, it could backfire at times, so you have to, I mean, you can't make every single thing, you know, explosively fun and hilarious. I mean, some people need a serious vibe there occasionally. And that contrast, that's why they'll value the humor, because it's injected in a, in a thoughtful way. Um, but like I say, sometimes the humor, you, you can inject it at your own expense, because if they start sharing the laugh and you know you're laughing at yourself, I mean, laughter relaxes people. Um, so you're know, telling those anecdotes. So I, I've sometimes created texts about my own follies and weaknesses, and people laugh. You know, sh share a story. But the content then is there, and you've put in the the target um, feature, whether you're working with intonation, stress, whatnot. But um, you know, just as you can use motivational content, you can use humorous content, personalized content. It, it's, different possibilities are there to break down barriers because again no matter how great that content is designed you've thought about level appropriateness you've done word frequency lists you've really carefully crafted your stuff but you know what if there are barriers that are up it's not going to be effective I'm going to cut, cut us off now because we have 25 seconds left so what we're going to do is just say thank you big thanks Bucketfuls of thanks I put on my Facebook page to have been, be connected now with Jennifer in this way. Look at all these thank yous. Goodbye to everybody. Please check uh, for the post-class task for Jennifer's class. I'm going to put it up in courseware today. Have a wonderful day, evening, wherever you are, Jennifer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peace thank you everyone, for joining. I love the experience.